Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Check it out. Do 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 do. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Can you see us? I certainly hope so. Hi, it's Virginia Stanley, uh, Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins Publishers. I'm joined here by my colleague. Hi, I'm Grace. Happy to be here. And uh, Lainey is working the back end of things. She's not feeling great today, but she's with you and with us in spirit. And with us in person today are two authors who uh, have just... Um, brought such beautiful, beautiful books to the table. They are coming out um, next month and we cannot wait to talk to you about it. Um, we have with us today, Chitra Deva Karuni, the author of the forthcoming book, Independence, and Brianna Labuskas, the author of the forthcoming Librarian of Burned Books. Chitra and Brianna, welcome both. Hi, thank you for having us. It's so exciting. Thank you. It's so great to have you both on here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us about your books. We'll have the I spaced on the on the pub dates one in my intro. So we'll get it all sorted out. But these are such exciting books, very different books, historical fiction um, is uh, as I was saying before, it's it's just librarians. All readers really love historical fiction. You can learn so much, the pages fly, and the characters come to life. And boy, have you brought some remarkable, unforgettable characters to readers with these two, with these two wonderful books. So uh, Chitra, Chitra Devakaruni, author of Independence. Uh, we're going to be speaking with you first today, and we put we'll have a little Brianna go into the virtual green room and then we'll vice versa, and then we'll come back together. But before we do that, we just wanted to welcome you both to just say hi and hi to librarians and anything that you want to say to each other. We just realized that you had not met each other until right now and you got on the screen. This is true. And I wanted to say I am so happy to be here. It's a delight to meet all of you, Brianna and the whole Harper team over here, and especially all the librarians. I love libraries. They have been one of my places of refuge from the time I came here as a poor student with no money. Really, libraries have saved my life. And mm -hmm. I wanted to say a big thanks. And I'm so excited to be speaking with librarians. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Um, I am also, I love libraries. I wrote a book about them. <laughs> um, so I'm super stoked to talk to you guys. And I mean, how cool were those covers together though? They were so pretty. We were just saying how the, the colors are so pretty together. Um, so I'm so excited to hear about your book and talk about mine and just be here with all of you guys. Likewise, yeah. I've been reading up on your book and it is just very, very interesting. I know you're really right like in. the the way into historical fiction. I feel like they're like I kind of am in a little bit of a saturated time period, but uh, for yours is so interesting. Different slice. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, much to learn, much to discuss, and um, the the common denominator here, uh, two brilliant writers who, as I say, have brought such powerful, important stories for readers. Um, so I, yeah, it's an honor to talk with both of you. So um, right now we're gonna speak with, with Chitra and we're gonna ask Brianna to go and have virtual M&Ms in your virtual green room with your, <laughs> your, life, your real life puppy Jinx, who's yeah. adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you in a bit, okay? Sounds good. All right. Hi. Hello. Hi. So, uh, Chitra, thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us. I'm going to give a brief bio and then we're going to dive right into um, the book and what you want readers to know about um, this time and place and this compelling story and the 
sisters that the these very different sort of different sisters i mean i think in the bottom there that you know that the, there's connective tissue there obviously they're sisters but they're they have dif different um dreams and trajectories so first your bio so chitra deva karuni you are an award-winning best-selling author poet activist and teacher of writing your works um, been published in over 50 magazines, including the Atlantic Monthly and the New Yorker. And your writing has been included in over 50 anthologies, including the Best American Short Stories and the O. Henry Prize and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. Your books have been translated into 29 languages, and many of these books have been used for campus-wide and city-wide reads, which is such a powerful thing. I mean, to, you know, to, to have that... Um, to have that 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 net cast so widely and to affect so many readers is uh, is so powerful. Um, your several of your works have been made into films and plays. You live in Houston with your husband and your uh, two sons. Now, your new book, Independence, um, it takes place during the real partition of British India uh, into the Dominion of. Indian Dominion of Pakistan. It's the end of the British rule and the, the land is split and this, there's this massive refugee situation. Um, uh, it's your time to talk about your book um, and we have lots of questions. So give, give readers here, librarians, viewers, a sense of the backdrop of this book, the historical aspect of it, the 75th anniversary of the independence of India, and um, I'll let you I'll let you talk, and I'll stop. Okay, and feel free to ask you know any questions if I say things that are not clear. So this book is really very important to me because I grew up hearing stories from my grandfather and my mother about this time, which is probably the most important thing to happen in modern India because this is when modern India was formed, when India became a nation um, and it kind of pushed off the British yoke. It was a time of great excitement and joy, but it also turned into a time of great grief because as the two country, countries, India and Pakistan were split apart, there was immense rioting, fighting, people dying, um, and as always, you know, women and children suffered the most. So it is a time of great joy and great pain. And I hope I've been able to bring some of that into the book. Now the book is, yes, it is definitely very uh, entrenched in the politics of its time, but it is about this family with three sisters and you can see them on the cover and they're dressed very differently and I won't give away why, but it has something to do with their situations as well as their personalities. So these three sisters are going to live through this time. Uh, they are going to go through great ups and downs, adventures that they had never imagined. They had come from a pretty sheltered family background in the area of Bengal, which will be on the Eastern edge of the partition. So India would be split into India and East Pakistan at that time. And very little has actually been written about that part of uh, independence and partition. Mostly novels are written about the Northwestern border uh, where Punjab is split into the two countries. So I really wanted to tell the story of this family, this family living in Calcutta and in the rural area around Calcutta and how people were affected, how women were affected, and how these three women deal with uh, the adventure, the tragedy, and the having to move forward. And uh, I, I wanted to title this independence because I think that word works on many different levels in this novel. Of course, there is national independence, but there's also individual independence, and the independence that these three women learn, are forced to learn, and how they really understand what it means to be independent and what are sometimes the things you have to give up for that. Yeah, I love the theme of, um, you know, 
sisterhood and independence in this. Could you talk a bit more about the role of women, uh, particularly the theme of their, you know, personal independence? Sure. So first of all, uh, what many people don't know, and even people in India, I think, are sometimes forgetting because now it's 75 years. And this is a very special year. Uh, so I'm very glad that the book is coming around right now. It is the 75th anniversary. It's a great time to look back and see what has been gained and what has been lost. But in this family, the whole idea of independence, and I'll talk about it on the personal level. So in this family, this is a rural family. They're very traditional. And the three sisters want three very different kinds of things out of their lives. The oldest one, Deepa, is very beautiful. What she wants is a good marriage. She wants to marry into a rich family, have hopefully a handsome husband, and be in charge of her household. The youngest one, Priya, she has the secret desire. Their father is a doctor, and Priya wants to follow in his footsteps and become a doctor. Now, this is a dream that is very difficult to achieve at this time. There were almost no women doctors in India at this time. So her father's trying to discourage her, but her way of being independent would be to follow this trajectory. It's going to lead her to many unexpected places, including the United States. But for her, that is what independence means. And I think in some ways, the third sister, Jamini, she's the middle sister. She is the one who will have to figure out what independence means. She's not beautiful. She has um, a slight deformity, a leg deformity that makes her limp when she walks. So she cannot expect the traditional you know, happy marriage. She's not really interested in a career and she's going to have to find another way of becoming independent. She's going to do that through art because she and her mother both love the folk art, the folk stitching art of making kantas or quilts. And that is a big part of Bengal. The women make quilts in Bengal. That's, that's like a big tradition. And she is going to, she's going to learn to do that and to love it. But also, you know, she's going to have to try and figure out, is this enough to make me happy? Yeah, it's it's very clear you put a lot of love and thought into these characters. And um, I do have a question from one of our librarians, Jennifer Winberry asked, how did you decide to have three sisters as opposed to, you know, two or four or however many? Right. Well, one of the things that I love and I always put into my books to some extent or other are our old folk tales from Bengal and from India and our old fairy tales. And you'll notice that a lot of those Tales have three sisters in them because three is a destabilizing number, right? Because there's always going to be like the third sister. Is she going to take this one side? Is she going to take this other one side? Is she going to branch out in some other direction? Uh, the middle sister particularly is often overlooked because oh, she's in the middle. The first one is the first one. She, she was the first child to be loved. And the last one is known to be the last one. So in fact, you know, uh, the eldest one is the mother's favorite. The youngest one is the father's favorite. And the middle one feels kind of left behind and is, is jealous of her sisters in some ways, in many ways. But she's also a complex character. So she loves them. She loves them and she's jealous of them. And I thought just having three sisters creates that tension, creates that triangulation. Uh, which is important to this novel, which is about loving and hating at the same time. Uh, we have another question from um, a librarian, uh, well, it's Kim McGee, and she says, this book proves that sisters are all the same all over the world and that there will always be women with powerful dreams. Um, uh, let's see, Vicki Nesting oh, says- I wanted to say something back. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that comment because this book, it's set in India, but I really think of this as a universal story. 
both on the political level and I think particularly relevant to the United States because the United States also went through an independence war. They also threw off the British yoke. They also had to give up many things and sacrifice many things and there were many deaths. So I think this love for independence is something that people in this country will resonate with just as much as people in India. And yes, uh, the time of destabilization, the three sisters, I think that is, of course, a universal story. Women learning what they're capable of mm -hmm. and having to go through difficulty in order to be pushed to the ultimate that they can achieve. Um, there's, um, family is really at the core of this novel. Um, there's, there's so much love here. There's, there's a balance between hatred and, and, and love and love for nation, love for family, romantic forbidden love. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Love is a big theme here. And you're right. You know, for, and one of the things that I really enjoyed writing about, which is different from my other books, which are also often very family oriented and deal with love on that family or personal level is love for country. Because the father, he was a freedom fighter in his youth and he has always, always loved India. He just is looking forward to independence so much. Now, some terrible things will happen to him. We won't give those things away, but he is for him, Yes, he loves his family, but really he loves his country, his motherland, most of all. And that is what keeps coming back. And that causes a conflict, right? So this book is about public life versus private life and how sometimes responsibilities on both sides can be in conflict. His uh, wife would like him to put all his energy into his family, but he feels he has to do more for the nation. So he gives up a lot. He runs a free clinic. The family is poor as a result because yeah, there's no money coming in. So I wanted to bring that kind of love and the importance of that kind of love where you have this ideal and you're willing to give up things, including things that you could have done for your family. So I want to show both sides of that. It's great for him. It's not so great for his wife and daughters. But then I wanted to talk about family love. That is very big. That is at the center. And at the end of all things, when things become really tough for the sisters, they will put aside other desires and put aside other priorities and do what they can for each other and for the family. So the importance of family, how, how it nurtures us, but how it also demands things of us. These are some of the things that I wanted to bring out. And yes, there is a big love story in here. <laughs> and I'll just say this much, it's a problematic love story because two of the sisters love the same man. How is yeah. it going to end? People will have to find out. To find out. Oh. People are like threes again, <laughs> in a different way. So um, do we want to, let's, why don't we show some of the photographs that you have provided and if you can speak to those and then you'll do a brief reading. Yeah. Okay. And sure. Yes. Like I had to do a lot of research for this book because I really wanted to be accurate in what I was portraying. It, it, it's so important, right? Because some of the things that happened during this freedom struggle would otherwise seem unbelievable. The amount, the number of people who died, the ways in which they died, the things that the British did before they left, kind of uh, a death blow to the country by dividing it up into pieces. So I really had to do a lot of research. And this is a scene, it's just a scene from my city, Kolkata, and uh, look at the number of people on the street. And you know, it was not easy for them to do it. Even at this point, the British uh, would get the army on the street, they would beat up people, um, people would end up in hospital, people would die, people would get shot, and still these people are there. And please notice, not just men, but women also. So this was a time when women really came out of the home, 
onto the streets and they said, this is our country too, we will fight for it. And the woman whose face is on the poster, her name is Sarojini Naidu. She was a very close associate of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and she marched with him and fought with him. And she is a big inspiration to the women in this book. So I, I wanted to really, I'm glad we are showing this picture. All right, so uh, here is the newspaper, the edition of August 15th, and um, just the hope, the wild scenes of jubilation, the crowds in the festive mood. Here is a picture of uh, the first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, but what it doesn't show underneath, it wasn't there on the top half of the paper, is that violence has already broken out, cities are burning as Hindus and Muslims are trying to figure out how to get to the correct side of the border. Here is uh, August 15th and Nehru is giving a speech in Delhi and you can see like thousands of people. And it's the first time the Indian flag, which is mentioned many times in this novel is being flown. It's the tricolor flag, saffron, green, and in the middle, white with the Ashoka, the wheel of law, the Ashoka wheel. But before independence happened, we are going back one year. This is a scene that's very important in the book. The Calcutta riots happen, and it's one of the first major Hindu Muslim riots um, that occur. And looking back, it is just you know, I was looking back and thinking about this time. When I wrote this book, there were many times when I was really in tears just seeing what people did to each other. And it's still, I can't understand. Nobody understands why all of a sudden on this one day, which was called Direct Action Day, and leaders were going to give speeches, all of a sudden things just turned into a massacre between Hindus and Muslims, and that bitterness would stay with them over the next year until the country becomes independent. Now, the next photo before we advance, we'll just want to give folks a heads up. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit graphic, but it, it tells the story so sadly. And so with that in mind, you can watch or turn away. Yes, so this is just one picture of one street where you can see the devastation, the death, the killings, a lot of People who suffered, as often happens in war situations, were the ones who were powerless, right? So the poor, the women, the children. This is in a poor neighborhood, you can see, as compared to some of the earlier photos. And it, it was a neighborhood that was set on fire. And so you see, you know, dead bodies, burnt bodies. Yeah, terrible things. And sometimes, you know, we have to look at those things because if we don't, then if we, that if we forget, there's more of a chance of that happening over and over. Sadly important, critical really. So this is the sentence that I used as an epigraph for my novel. And this is a woman, a poet, she was writing right at that time. Uh, and then she lived on into the in, into independent India and wrote much more. But I really loved what she said here. Many stories are not written on paper, but are written on the bodies and minds of women. And I hope that in my novel, I've shown some of that, that how women experience these stories of political turmoil in a whole different way. And here is Gandhi, who is also going to be a major character in this novel, at least in the way in which people remember him and think about him. And that's, you know, that's one of his sayings that I was very inspired by, because especially at this time when the world is just going crazy, big things are happening. What are you going to do? This is what the three sisters learn. All you can do is change how you react. This is a picture of Gandhi with Sarojini Naidu, and we mentioned her already. She's going to be a big inspiration, especially for the youngest daughter, Priya, 
because Sarah Jeanine Naidu does something important. She's one of the first women to take part in this independence movement. She, you know, comes out of the home. She's on the streets. She's willing to lead the marches. She's willing to go to jail. Uh, she's willing to get beaten up. So uh, Priya especially is very inspired by her at the difficult moments in Priya's life. So it's, I hope those pictures just gave us a sense of that time. You know, I, I've tried to create word pictures through the book, but it it's really important, I think, to see the images as well. Absolutely, to provide a backdrop and and sadly to see that um, there is, uh, you know, what's happening today. You know, the different ideologies and how relevant this is to India and and the United States today. It's you know, you said it, you said it. I feel that so strongly all over the world. People are killing each other because no. they don't agree on ideology, on religion, on, you know, they, they're willing to commit great acts of violence. I mean, here in this country, too, it no. is so sad to see that if we don't remember the cost of this kind of thinking, right. I think we are really going to have to pay a very high price. So I think one of the things, one of our hopes as we write books and as we read books is that books can change lives because they make us see things or think in a different way. That's, well, and that's what your book does. And I, I think, you know, positioned with this novel of these characters, um, these sisters, this father uh, and, and the love that they have for each other and the discovered love that they that they find, um, you know, all with the backdrop of what we've just been talking about is really such a compelling read. Um, could you, uh, we're gonna wrap it up fairly soon, but you're gonna hang around and come back after, but you were gonna read a tiny little bit for us, Chitra? Yes, I will. I will read something in just a moment. And this is from early on. So we saw the picture of the riots and the killing. So this is happening on the day of the riots. And what has happened just before this is the father of the family, Nabo Kumar, he has gone to his clinic because people are dying like all around the clinic or people are injured and he feels he has to go there to help. But now he has been hurt. He's been, you know, he's been shot. So the family, the three sisters and the mother, they're trying to get to him. They don't know what his condition is. They're just terrified. They're just trying to get from their house to the clinic in a city that is full of people killing people. They are going to, they are Hindus, but they're going to go through a Muslim area. So now the women have uh, put on burqas so that they will look like Muslim women. So that's the background. And the three sisters are there, the mother is there. Raza, who is also a doctor at the clinic, has come to guide their way through this dangerous situation. And Amit, who is their friend from the family friend from the village, is with them. So this is the characters. Now they hurry down the alley, six of them stepping shadow to shadow, startling at every sound. Raza in front, Amit behind. The women huddled in the center. Raza had brought a skull cap for Amit and for the women, burkas that belonged to nurse Salima. They will be safer this way because they're crossing a Muslim neighborhood. Priya's burqa smells of clove and garlic. Through its net veil, the world shimmers unreal. Deepa supports Bina, their mother. Jamini clutches Priya's hand damply. Priya hears Bina whisper. She's telling their father to hold on until she arrives. They have reached the street where the clinic is located, the last, most dangerous stretch. They will have to cross a major thoroughfare, many street lamps, no opportunity to shelter in shadows. There has been some heavy fighting here recently. Priya sees bodies spread eagled on the ground. Some have fallen into the drains that line the road. At her feet, 
a hacked off arm covered in blood. Hindu or Muslim, in death, there is no difference. She doubles over, retching. The men too are shocked into stopping. Behind her, Deepa and Jamini moan. Only Bina remains fixed on her goal. Hissing at them to be silent, she picks up her pace, giving them no option but to run after her. Lucky that the rioting has moved away, else no burqa could have saved them. Even as Priya thinks this, a group of men comes around the corner. Seeing Bina's small party, they begin to run toward them with frenzied yells. Their leader wields a sword. His forehead is streaked with vermilion. And I'm going to stop right there. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Um, Chitra, this has been wonderful. Please, if you can, we'll put you into the green room and we'll bring Brianna out. And then if you can both come back at the end, that'd be great. Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure. Thank and you. Hi you. to everyone who's watching all the libraries. <laughs> and I got a lot of love in the comments. So. So much love in the comments and they're from all over the country. And we'll come back to a few questions that we didn't get to, but just to be clear, Independence is on sale January 17th, 2023. I, I uh, want to make that clear. So, but um, Chitra, you'll come back, yep. Yes. Okay, we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, and now, there she is. Brianna, you're back. I'm gonna turn it over to Grace. All right. I am so excited to talk to you today about the Librarian of Burn book, Books, which is on sale February 2023. Um, a little bit about you. So the first decade of her career, Brianna worked as a journalist for national news organizations covering politics and policy. She got her start in romance and still loves uh, swoon-worthy meat cutes, don't we all? She is a Wall Street Journal and Washington Post bestselling author of seven books. Um, she loves reading and writing, psychological thrillers, and historical fiction. So this forthcoming book, The Librarian of Burn Books, is your historical fiction debut about three women, and I will hand it over to you to talk about it. Yeah, awesome. Um, first of all, the independence looks amazing. <laughs> the excerpt, like all of the details. Anyways, just wanted to shout that out. Um, I was fascinated the whole time. Um, anyways, so uh, the librarian is about three women um, and they kind of represent, they're in different time periods. They represent the themes and things that I like to think about of each of their time periods. Um, so, oh, thank you so much. Um, so I, the first one is Althea, and she is kind of this isolated American writer. She's dropped into 1933 Berlin, and she just doesn't really know anything about foreign politics. And so her liaison's a Nazi, and she goes in, she's like, oh, this seems okay. And then she gets there, and she's like, oh, this does not seem okay, <laughs> so eventually. And all that kind of culminates in the um, book burnings in May. Um, and so I just really like that time period of how fast everything happened for that five months that she's there. Um, the Reichstag burn, um, you know, the boycott, all sorts of things. And like that progression of being able to have like the world be like, I don't know what's going on. And then kind of realizing it eventually. Um, the second character is Hannah and she's in 1936 Paris. And she works in this library called um, the Library of German Nazi Burn Books. Um, and it came about from German Jewish emigres who wanted to uh, fight the fascist tide across Europe. Um, and so they created a library that housed the books that the Nazis wanted to burn. And they also, you know, it was more than a library. It was kind of like a gathering place. It was like a, they created pamphlets to distribute and all sorts of things um, to fight fascism. Because I do think a little bit we forget, like, <laughs> that it wasn't an isolated like belief. This, there was tons of anti-Semitism and tons of bigotry um, in Europe at that time. And so I really wanted to have her, you know, to explore that and to uh, be able to fight that even as she's a little bit in limbo. Um, and so that's why I wanted to put her there. And then the final character is Viv. And she's kind of the pulse point of the book. She, um, she works for the Council on Books in Wartime. Um, 
and her, she said in 1944, the council was created to boost morale by using books to help soldiers, you know, fight the low points of their time. Um, but they're, one of their most successful programs is the Armed Services Editions, which were these paperbacks. They sent them overseas by the millions. Um, and I had never heard of it before I started researching this. So it was really cool to find this like little uh, slice of history um, that was so, like books are so important. Um, and so she's working at this council and um, uh, this, this senator, uh, very powerful senator. This is this is real. This happened. Um, he was from Ohio, and he wanted to essentially hobble the program through a censorship amendment um, to a voting act, right? Or voting act. Um, and so she is like, "This is the hill I'm dying on." She's like, "No, like <laughs> we are not censoring this program. We like the soldiers rely on this so much." Um, and so she goes to war against the senator, and the whole book is kind of her figuring out how to beat him, kind of in the public space of like, "We don't need this censorship. Um, soldiers deserve to have these books to read. That brings them a lot of comfort." Um, and so through that fight all three lives kind of intertwine towards a dramatic climax. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, you just mentioned, you know, when you started doing your research more about, uh, you know, banned books, what, what made you think, okay, this is what I'm going to write about? Like, was it a specific place um, that you were reading about, whether it was, you know, the banned books in Brooklyn or um, in Paris? And are these things based really strictly on real history or was it like a loose interpretation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the thing that got me like, this is the, this is the idea for the book is the armed services editions. Um, so I was writing it in late 2020 and I was just reading this book called when books went to war. It's fantastic. It's nonfiction. Um, and, uh, yes, this is the armed services. How cool is it? Um, and I just thought it was so amazing that uh, they sent, they made these, they're, um, they kind of really popularized paperbacks. And so um, the idea of like books connecting and helping soldiers like really resonated. And then the fact that there was a censorship fight. And so we, we don't really have the, it wasn't at that level right now, the, the, um, the book banning fervor um but I could see you could see it coming so it like very much resonated with not only that it was a censorship fight but that it was kind of embroiled in national politics and the senator who wanted to kind of hurt the president at the time because this was a very popular program um and so like once I realized all that I was like this is the perfect this needs to be told um so that story is fairly it hues pretty closely to the events that happened. Um, Viv is a fictional character. All of my characters are fictional, um, except for like side ones that pop in. Like I like to have like historical cameos <laughs> um, of people. Um, but beyond that, the main characters are are fictional. Um, but the whole the 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 fight was real and um and they really tried to get public opinion going towards this program and like all of that, how they built it up is, is um, pretty real. The, the fine, the finale is a little um, sensationalized <laughs> um, just to make it fun, but it also kind of hues fairly closely with what happened. Um, and then, you know, the, the two libraries, so the one in Brooklyn and the one in Paris, they both popped up kind of organically. Um, they weren't, actually related they just like happened to come up together which I thought was pretty cool too um and so yeah the one in Brooklyn was more of a traditional library where they just like housed the books that the Nazis wanted to burn um but it was part of the Jewish center so I do have you know um some fictionalization in there but for the most part they they that's how they acted um and were true to life and then you can't write, you know, anything without the book burnings in Berlin. So <laughs> that's where that came from too. So those are like, I think, um, yeah. So this, there's another aspect of it I didn't mention, um, but there is a sapphic love story. Um, and I came up with that because I had, I was writing my first chapter for Hannah, the one in Paris. And I was like, 
you know, I'm very much a pantser. So I was just kind of writing, trying to figure her out. And I was like, oh, she's heartbroken. And then I was like, oh, she was in love with Althea. Um, and so that kind of sent me down um, a path into like the historical queer Berlin and Paris, which were so interesting. And I hadn't really realized how much of it was like this thriving culture in um, pre-Hitler pre Berlin. Like people were out, <laughs> there were films, there were magazines, there was an entire community of queer people. They had um, cabarets and nightclubs and all sorts of things like devoted to this community, um, which is another kind of like sad parallel <laughs> that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of pushback and you saw the same thing happen in 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 uh, hit in Hitler's Berlin is he is the pushback against um, a more progressive community and so this is um, the Eldorado which is one of the um, big nightclubs in Berlin in like the late twenties um, and so you can kind of see uh, you know, women dancing with women and um, transgender people they didn't have the the word for that but um, that's what was happening in there. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of like a really cool aspect to be able to, to feature in the book. And then Paris actually had a pretty thriving community as well. Um, I think there's a picture of Le Monocle, if the one at the bar, yes. Um, that is the oldest and um, kind of more famous, famous of the Paris lesbian clubs. It's called Le Monocle, which I am bad at French, so I don't think I'm saying that quite right, but you know, um, <laughs> and uh, so they would use, they would dress with monocles um, sometimes. So it was really cool to be able to dive into that culture as well. So this is D-Day. Um, I just wanted to include this because I, there's a chapter on D-Day and there's just this um, photo essay that I found on it. And it was, you could track the whole day like you could see people going to church you could see people going to there was a rally held by the um the Guardia, the governor or <laughs> mayor um at the time and uh you know i loved this moment where everybody is just stopped like <laughs> i don't know if you can see but it was it's like the troops are troops are invading um and i think there was just like this sense that like, was really fun to be able to write like this sense of you're so far away you're so far away from like your boys who are fighting overseas and you're just getting able to get news um and not be able to you know do much else other than stare at the news and I feel like we can all relate to that right <laughs> like just staring at updates of the news and I thought this was really in indicative of of that feeling oh yeah so this is the um the invitation to the opening for the one in Brooklyn. Um, I just liked that it exists <laughs> and um, that Einstein was the keynote speaker. Um, and I think I love just seeing like little snippets of history like this. There was the D-Day one. I really liked seeing the front page of the New York Times. Like the fact that we live in an era that we can kind of just Google this and it's online and available to us is really a privilege for us historical writers <laughs> to be able to add like a lot of authenticity um, to it. And this is the um, the Brooklyn Burn Books Library, which is just, oh, I just think it's so poetic that there was a two libraries that came about at the same time that existed to protect culture that someone else wanted to wipe out. Mm -hmm. I love the research you put into this. And we actually did have another question. Uh, Nicole oh. asked if you read any um, actual soldiers' letters. And I think that's a great question considering this isn't a spoiler. The book opens like with right. it, getting that letter. So I think it's a wonderful question. Yeah, it's actually, there's a bunch of them in, um, the first ones that I read were in that book, When Books Go to War. So she pulls um, Molly Gopto Manning pools in a bunch of examples but then you can also go find them um and they're just uh, I don't know it's I the ones that I put in there are, fic are fictionalized um and the one that the book opens with is Viv's letter from her um husband who died um which yeah it's not a spoiler it's the opening page <laughs> um <laughs> um and that's kind of why she becomes so embroiled in this fight and that becomes like such an important emotional fight for her um and but those were really intense but I kind of really liked the reporters 
um, takes on it. Like, so there, there was a bunch of foreign reporters who were stationed with um, soldiers and they were like joyously reporting on this. Like, um, the, I think the quote, the famous quote is like, they're more popular than pinups um, and cigarettes. <laughs> um, and so the books would come and then the soldiers would all like, counts and like try to like you know fight over these books and they'd be tearing them apart and like handing them to like when they're done they'd hand the pages to the other um soldiers who were waiting to read it and I I, I really liked the um I, I thought those were kind of cool like to have the reporters be like oh my god this is like so weird and interesting that this is happening and I I, I liked that I liked that take I love that you you talked about that at, at library journal's day of dialogue and that was that, that really st stuck with me because here they are so starved for many things. And what do they grab? The books. Yeah. Um, it says a lot. I think um, there's also, um, when we were talking, our previous uh, fight that I, uh, conversation that I also wanted to reiterate was um, when they were going on to D-Day and they um, had to sh like, you know, lose a lot of their bulk that um, they had to take only the most important thing that they thought were the most important thing for them. Um, and a lot of them took the armed services editions. So I always, <laughs> I always get like a little choked up at that. Yeah, that's something really powerful when you think about that. You know, um, he felt actually, he actually intervened and like made sure that there were more copies so that everyone on D everyone who was going to fight for D-Day was going to have available for them. So uh, yeah, 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 right. Anyways, <laughs> um, so can you talk about um, you know, kind of like with Chitra's book, then and now? You know, so much, so much then is happening now. Book banning, homophobia, senators with agendas. I mean wild dictators, you know, everything that we're, you saw that was going on then is happening even more than in the last few decades. What, if any, lessons do you want readers to take away from the characters in this book? What are you hoping that readers will take away from the book? I think, um, like, books aren't something to be afraid of. They're, you know, they're not something to use to control other people. Um, I mean, people do use them that way. <laughs> um, but I do think sometimes there's a lot of language that sounds good, that sounds like we're protecting people or, or children or, or what have you um, from this, but that's been used over and over again throughout history. And so I, there, <sighs> One of like one of my favorite quotes is like you know books are I have it on my website. It's like uh, books are that they they say we existed. They're they're culture saying that we existed. They're a voice saying we existed, um, and all of the foibles and all of the strengths and all of the everything of a culture and of a people and of a vo of voices um, to say that there are, are ones that shouldn't be heard or to kind of. Um, put bans in place to limit that is really wiping out entire cultures. And um, we just need to really, I hope that people take away that, that it's really important that even if you don't personally agree with something that, um, that knowledge exists, like it's out there, like you can't, burning a book is not going to ruin the like information. It's still going to be there. It's not going to, going to erase it. So doing that is just trying to hurt people, essentially. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, a little bit, one of the things that is different um, is how available books are now. So like burning a book is even more symbolic now than it was back then. Back then it was actually expensive to buy books. Um, and there were a lot of hardback versions and stuff like that. And not everybody had access to a ton of books. So I would say one of the positive parts of being in this era is that we do have a little bit more access and so burning a book is not necessarily getting rid of it completely. One of the more tragic aspects is um, there was an institute that studied like women and transgender and um, uh, homosexuality, all sorts of stuff, and um, they were raided like two to three days before the book burnings and all of that research was just 
burned. And so there was no, <laughs> there was no backup. <laughs> it was like research that was actually destroyed. And so that kind of really put us back a lot of ways. Um, I do like that we have a little bit more of access now that it's not going to completely de be destroyed, but um, that was kind of a difference there. Right, right. Um, you had a section, a small section that you were going to read from the book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, that's all. Um, okay, so Viv is trying to get the librarian who works at the Brooklyn Burn Books Library. She's trying to get her into this fight with Taft and to have her speak in front of Taft, but this librarian is very shy. <laughs> um, and so uh, she's like, convince me. So this is Viv. Um, when I first visited your library, I couldn't see a way forward with this fight, Viv admitted. But then you put into words why all of this is so important. We humans, we love telling each other stories. We've done just that in caves and in amphitheaters, in the globe and in kitchens and around campfires and in the trenches. Every culture, every country, every type of person in the world tells stories. They've been whispered and sung and written down on scraps of paper. And they have always been an indelible part of our very humanity. Viv blushed and stared very hard at her tea, aware that she had spent too many nights crafting exactly what her own speech would be in front of Taft. When I walked into the library and you stood there like a guardian of those stories, I just, Viv swallowed hard. Why I care, why I've always cared, is that I want to protect the idea that stories can help us understand each other and ourselves and our world, that even our darkest days can be more about more than simply survival. The way you talk about the library and the books, that's the message you sound, send every time. The librarian waited a beat, seeming to check if Viv was done. <laughs> you should have say that, you should just say all that instead of bringing me into all this. I've been saying that for months and have gotten nowhere. I'm not the story to tell, but you think I am, the librarian said. It was strange how obvious that answer was to Viv. What was it like that night, she asked, at the burnings in Berlin. The librarian tilted her head, curious but willing to play along, wet. <laughs> The corner of his mouth twitched up. How many people would give me that answer? About 10,000, the librarian suggested. Viv shook her head. No, they wouldn't. Goebbels would say successful or patriotic. A resistance fighter might say tragic. A German st student would say rousing. It matters who's talking, who is telling the story. And what is a more accurate story? No, Viv said, but it is what makes it your story. So. <laughs> Love that. Love that. No, that's great. Um, Grace, do we have questions? Um, let me see. I do have one that I'd like to read out. Um, so what kind of books were you reading while writing this aside from your research? Like, do you have a favorite one or was it just like, I'm focusing on writing, I'm not reading anything else? I think that's what well, I would do with a pretty book. <laughs> well, um, a fun part of this was I got to read some of the um, books that were ASEs. Um, and so, I mean, they didn't really, I didn't really include any plot points from them, but just being able to read like what the soldiers were reading was really cool. Um, and my favorite was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. It was so good and I had never read it before. Um, and so anyone who hasn't should absolutely read it. Um, but what I loved about that book was that it was the soldier's favorite book that they were sent. They had to like ship it multiple times. And I thought that was so interesting because the protagonist is a nine-year-old girl in Brooklyn. Mm. And like to picture soldiers, like finding that the most relatable, I thought was so interesting. Um, and it's because it reminded them of home, you know, like it reminded them of normality and they were so far away from that. And it reminded them like why they were fight and fighting, fighting. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And the second most popular one was a um, a chicken, uh, something, oh, it's a chicken every Sunday, a chicken dinner every Sunday, I think it's called, a similar situation um, of just like that, what they were craving was normalcy. Um, mm. And then one of the other popular ones, and this is, I found very fun, was um strange love and it was like romance and sex and uh, uh <laughs> you know like um controversy and stuff and so I thought that was kind of fun like they craved like the home and all sorts of stuff but they also craved like a little drama that was like not them fighting you know it was kind of like ooh, like <laughs> romance <laughs> um, <laughs> so I also liked that a lot Thank you for sharing all of that. I have one quote to read. If all of that hasn't convinced you to read this book, I'm sure this will. 
Um, in her excellent debut novel, Brianna Labuskis writes, of loving, writes lovingly of the power of books, libraries, and friendship to sustain us in difficult times while offering a stark, unmistakably relevant warning about the dangers of censorship. Fans of historical fiction featuring courageous women will savor the librarian of burned books. And that was said by Jennifer Chiaverini, author of Resistance Women. So I like my like heart exploded at that. But um, the <laughs> fun fact on that one is Resistance Woman, she has a strong storyline set in like the early 30s Berlin. And I had read that as research for the librarian. And I just like thought that was so cool that she then read the book. But <laughs> it is her, her, that book heavily influenced that time period um, for me. Yeah. And she is so lovely. I don't, and she's just a, she's, she's one a of my, that's one of my favorite World War II books, hands down. Like, I love her writing. I love that book. Like, oh. yeah. 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 So I can't even imagine how your head must have no, exploded. No, my head exploded. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Um, well, th thank you for, for uh, sharing those images and for reading that excerpt, which was just so like throat lump. Um, can we, so let's, let's bring Chitra back and um, we'll just say wrap up and I believe me, we could keep on talking with lots of librarians here. Just so much love, lots of, lots of comments for both books. There's one more uh, question to go back to Chitra. Hi Chitra, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. All right. Oh, I wanted to say that was so fun, Brianna. I really enjoyed hearing about your book. And it reminded me of something that I'd forgotten to mention, that there's an important librarian character in my novel. She, Fine. she works in the American Library in uh, Calcutta, in the city of Calcutta. She's going to have a big effect on the youngest sister. Oh, that's so cool. That's well, see, more connective tissue. And and what better audience to let them know than this than this one right here with librarians coming from everywhere. There are folks here from, from all over the place and little hearts are bubbling up. And um, this has been such a wonderful hour. I, there were just two questions quickly I wanted to get to. Um, and this is from, and I'm, I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name. Uh, it's P-R-A-G-Y-A. J-A-I-N, and Chitra, if you might know how to pronounce the name, because I really don't, and I don't want to shred it. What's the first name again? P-R-A-G-Y-A. -A. Pragya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pragya is saying, hi, I'm from Calcutta. To get to know the book is set here is so unexpected and exciting. I love your writing. It gave me a new perspective on our epics and I can't wait to read Independence. I'd like to know what you did enjoy about writing this book. What drove the process for you? That's a great question. I have to say, I really did enjoy this book, but writing it was also very painful. Um, I, I literally was in tears a lot. Um, I, I would be writing, my husband would come into the room and, you know, at first he was concerned because <laughs> I'm using up boxes of tissue crying. And then, but towards the end of the book, he was like, oh, okay, you're writing another scene. That's why you're crying. But I really felt, I think what I felt so strongly was that deep desire of people to be independent. That is such a human desire, more than a desire, it is a need. And I think once we are independent or when we are when we have been independent for a while we begin to take that for granted and i so want people not to take that those you know the right that many people fight fought for so that we could become independent both in america and in india i do want people to just value it and keep that spirit of independence alive to keep that oneness so i think that was a big feeling that I had as I was writing the whole book. And one of the things that was very emotional for me, and Pragya, you will probably understand this, is that during our independence war, uh, so many things were banned by the British. But one of the things that kept people going were the songs. There were songs mm -hmm. of national 
um, I don't know, resistance that people would sing uh, among themselves or they'd sing when they went on marches. And as I wrote this book, I listened to a lot of music and I think that's kind of seeped into the book. So those were some feelings I had. We talked about this, you know, on a lot of different uh, interviews and just that music really is such a universal language. I mean, I know that's nothing new that I'm saying, but it really does sort of level that field somewhat when there's so much difference and so much animosity. And that really is something that that can speak to everyone, even if you don't know what the words are. Right. And it was something that brought the Hindus and Muslims together because these songs were very secular. They were very nationalistic. They were for everyone. And, you know, they're all available, um, you know, on the internet. They're like beyond the, they're free. People can listen to them. And I certainly hope that people will listen to some of these songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have another question. Uh, Vicki said about independence. I love the cover. Can you tell us about how it was chosen? It seems to represent the book very well and really draws the reader in. And I think that about both of these books. So I would love to hear both of you talk a little bit about that as well. About the cover? Yep. And how it yeah. was chosen. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you both Bridget. have physical ones to look at. <laughs> well, you know, I loved the cover. I thought that uh, the art department did such a good job because it's so symbolic, right? They're moving from kind of a darker area into light, but they're moving into a future that's a little hazy. We don't know what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, I just, I love the three sisters in the center. Uh, I thought it created a, a real feel of what this novel is about, about how the future, the future of independent India was so exciting and scary at the same time and really turned out to be, that whole time turned out to be what people did not expect. And people learned things about themselves that they had never hoped, never thought they would learn. These three sisters will learn that they are capable of standing up to a lot more than they thought was ever possible. I like how it's like, um, sorry, but I like how the, uh, it almost looks like a photograph that's like worn at the edges and stuff. Like, I think that's such a cool, cool vibe to it too. Yeah, I thought they did a very nice effect, yeah. right? The old and then moving yeah. into the new. Yeah. Yeah. I love your cover too. Oh, thank I looked you. at it for a long time. <laughs> I have a question about this one really quick. Is that Hannah then? Is this it really is Hannah? Hannah? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, yes, <laughs> <Anna. laughs> um, and yeah, so this is the library in Paris, obviously. Um, and the one, the thing that I like the most about the cover, I love everything about the cover, but I love the burned, um, the burned edges at the bottom. Um, I thought that was pretty cool that they did, they were able to do that. Um, and I just also like that it kind of shows, it's not super fancy, like the library was, it wasn't fancy. It was in a, a flat in Paris, like a one, one you know, one level uh, a room. And they just kind of put this together with scraps of a research project on fascism, which is a long story, so never mind. Um, but I, I kind of like how it feels like you're in an attic almost. And like, it feels like, you know, not, slick or anything like that so I really liked that and then yeah Hannah kind of looking out into into space is yeah I really like that. I forgot to say something so the designers used the colors of the Indian flag for this which I thought yeah. was very very cool and they did it in a nice subtle way so that people who know or people who look it up will recognize it but it's just a nice cover otherwise nice color compliments what a nice touch. That's so thoughtful. Like the little details. That's awesome. Both so beautiful, really so beautiful. And it's, it's so, it's so interesting to, to get, you know, to hear from authors, what you all think. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a back and forth process with the jackets, but it's really neat to hear what you think. And those sort of like hidden bits, you know, the, 
the, the bottom part of the librarian of burn books where it's burned or the color of the flag. And it's just, and, and going toward the light and you, you know, you see that this it's old and then you're going, it's crisper and it's newer and it's going, it's forward thinking. And uh, they're just so beautiful. And they, you both, uh, you know, we, we've talked about how um, while these are very different stories, there's, there really is so much connective tissue between them both. And um, I thank you both for, for talking about, um, you know, sort of the way things were and sadly how the way some things still are and mm -hmm. that all you can keep doing, I suppose, is uh, talking and, 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 and you're creating these, these stories, writing these books is, is a language that we so appreciate because librarians take these important reads and they hand them off and then, you know, knowledge is power, as they say, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we could talk all day, but um, we're at the hour and change. And so we want to thank you both, Grace and I, and Lainey, who has uh, been sharing all of you gorgeous and compelling and important images. And thank you for reading and just filling in all of the blanks and, and um, you know, just informing us through your stories. Um, this was wonderful. So, so and you know what? I... Um, that was a wonderful quote that Grace read for Brianna's book. And I would like to get this quote in. Um, there are, you both have many, many quotes, many raves from, um, from fellow writers, but this one for, um, for Independence by Lisa C, uh, number one New York Times bestselling author says, Deva Karuni tells the story of India's independence through the eyes of three sisters, each of whom is uniquely different with her own desires and flaws. flaws. I cheered for them and cried with them as they moved through the history of their country that is at once devastating, inspiring, and triumphant. You will too. Oh. So you I was just so thankful, you know. Um yes, I'm I'm just so touched. I love Lisa's books. She writes about women in different situations in different countries, and she makes those places come alive. So I was so honored to get that quote from her. Well, yeah, and and uh, well, as Brianna said, you know, she got Jennifer's Jennifer's quote too. It's just like it just it does sort of you know, warm your heart and and uh, objectively pays great tribute to these wonderful works. So, Independence on sale January seventeenth, twenty twenty three, by Chitra. Deva Karuni and the Librarian of Burned Books goes on sale February 21st, 2023 by Brianna Labuskas. And uh, folks, if you wanna get in touch with us to have your these wonderful authors come virtually to your library, please do because their stories are wonderful, written or spoken. And as you can see, this has been a wonderful hour and change, hard to stop but we must. So we thank you both so much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's so awesome yeah. talking to you as always. Yeah. And for viewers, we'll have the eGalley links and so you can mm. get the books to read as well. Oh, Grace, say it one more time in case somebody didn't hear. Oh yeah, um, for the eGalleys, we will put the links to those um, in the description as well as in the comments so you can go read. Um, I'm sure that this was convincing enough. <laughs> Yep, and if you're speaking of, if you're if you're uh, the voting kind for library reads, you know it's always due the first day of the month prior to on sale, so independence uh, votes would be due by December first, and the librarian of burned books would be votes would be due on January first. So download the e-galleys and be swept away in these incredible stories. Thank you both so much again, and thanks librarians for tuning in. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs>